Thank you very much, Björn. Um, yes, I'm one here to give this talk. So blood, a very special juice. I think it's an exciting and sometimes very emotional theme in clinics. So let's start with some facts about blood transfusion. So now we're coming into clinics. One donation can save up to three lives. Every second second, someone needs blood. 80% of the population needs at least one blood transfusion, transfusion during their lifetime. And one in seven people admitted to the hospital needs blood. And of about 38% people to eligible to donate blood, only 3% do so annually. And this is, this is the worldwide data. And one unit of blood costs around this uh, 176 euros. This is data from Germany. See, these are the facts, so the blood transfusion from today. But always keep in mind, transfusion is the number one most common allergenic tissue transplant in medicine. And red blood cell transfusion the ex ex leads to exposure to these allergenic antigens, much more common than the sum of all other tissues and organs transplanted worldwide. So we really have, we have this issue, we have the problem of blood transfusion, and what are the challenges we have to cope nowadays? I just wanted to highlight one, and this is the HLA immunization, so the human leukocyte antigen immunization, which happens, which can uh, come about more than 10%. We can see this is literature from the kidney transplant because they have huger numbers than from per cardiac transplantation. And we know that home craft material transfusion, number one, the use of what we had before, ventricular assist device and mechanical support devices where we have to transfuse because of shear stress and that's what we heard in the talk before. And there's really data that some patients, so who are the ones who are the immunological responders? Nobody really knows up to now, but some patients are really highly sensitive and they have the PA, more than 80%. And these are the candidates we want to transplant in further life. Um, so what do they have? They really face the longer waiting interval on the list, a significantly higher mortality. They are good for acute cellular rejection, and they have, if we can see it in the biopsies, the antibody-mediated rejections. And on the long run, they really ha long run, they have chronic cardiac allograft vasculopathy. And that, looking at the literature and uh, going deeper into it, uh, we found this very nice uh, publication published in Blood. They looked at a huge um, clinical database, uh, clinical data records, and they, this is kind of a st stochastic model f of human red blood cell alloimmunization and the evidence, so who's a responder and who's not a responder. They, this were about 6,000 uh, databases and they looked for, so first they were the non-transfused patient as you can see here, and then there comes the red cell blood transfusion, and out of this 100%, 30% are responders, and 87% were non-responders. And from these responders, 30% produce these allo antibodies where we are really afraid of, and then they always produce and reproduce and reproduce, but as well, 70% have no response. We don't see the response uh, in, the, in, in our immuno, in our, um, in our uh, blood cell, uh, uh, yeah, um, what is it, Luminex technology. And as well, as well here, 70% don't produce, and for sure the non-responders, this is 100%. But nevertheless, so we know blood, nowadays, we know blood transfusion can cause not only good things, but also bad things. And now let's come, so what can we do to avoid red blood cell transfusion? And this is one of the biggest landmark papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they compare the liberal versus the restrictive transfusion strategy after cardiac surgery. And this was the transfusion indication threshold reduction trial. For sure, 2007 patients are enrolled, all adults. This is data from the, from the adult cardiac surgery population as primary outcome. They looked for serious infection, they looked for serious ischemic events like stroke and myocardial infection, and the secondary outcome was the number of units transfused and the length of ICU stay and hospital cost, and as well the 90-day mortality. So the threshold and the restrictive group, as you can see here on this graph, was um, the HB level should drop under 7.5 gram per deciliter, and in the liberal group, it was nine gram per deciliter. So, and the good news was there um, was 
no significant dif difference in the primary outcome, so the restrictive transfusion strategy was, was, um, was safe enough, but in the 90-day mortality, one of the secondary outcomes they were looking at, they had a significantly higher mortality in the restrictive um, uh, group, as you can see here. So we, we had, there were 4.1% in the randomized to restrictive threshold group in comparison to 2.4% in the liberal transfusion group. They couldn't find a reason for it. So all the patient data, they were equally, um, equally ill before transfusion, same age, everything was similar. So what did they do? they performed a larger trial. So this was a trial only performed in UK centers, and now we had this, this huge worldwide trial uh, where many centers from all over the, over the world, a randomized control trial, uh, patients <coughs> undergoing p uh, cardiac surgery, and you can see 5,000, oops, uh, <laughs> 5,243 patients are enrolled. We can dream of these numbers. We will never get these numbers. And so they took as primary outcome the 90-day mortality because they wanted to know from the trial before what happened to these patients. And just now, one month ago, also, this is all published in the New England Journal of Medicine, just one month ago, they, from the same trial, they also published the six months mortality data. And here you can see now the restrictive transfusion strategy was safe because the 90-day mortality as well as um, the six months mortality was equal in the restrictive in comparison to the liberal transfusion strategies. So this is all data from the adult cardiac surgery. Let's go to the, ah, no, and then this is, this is also from this month in the European Heart Journal. It's a nice review where they put together all these huge randomized controlled trials and look of what can we take out of it, what is, what is the message, and this is the take home message um, from this uh, review, and they say, so uh, they say, or the, the, the goal of the studies was to say that the restricted transfusion strategy is not inferior to liberal transfusion strategy. This is one of the one of the key points. Then they say for sure the reduction in allergenic red blood cells and exposure with a restrictive transfusion strategy has a clear resource, which we don't know up to now, up to now. and as well, on the long run, we will have uh, economic benefits. And there are still, I think there are still um, analyses going on on the, economic, um, uh, on the economic effects of restrictive transfusion strategies. So now let's get to the, let's get to the pediatric cardiac um, patients. There's this review from Colette et al. She published a lot. She's really very much into how can we save blood during um, uh, cardiac surgery. Um, and I tried to put it up, to sum it up in this figure. Um, so what can be the influencing factors, special factors in pediatric cardiac surgery to really save blood, save red blood cell transfusion? And if we start down here, so what about the hemostatic system? So it's immature, it's different from the adult population. And what are the aspects, what can we do preoperatively to really save blood? We can do the careful preoperative evaluation with the assessment of the coagulation and platelet function and all of this. And we can give APO before, yeah, what are the studies? What is the data out there? Like, like Sven Dietrich also said yesterday, there's not much available in the pediatric population. There are some observational studies which point out that it's posit that there's a positive for restrictive transfusion strategies, um, but that's only observational, uh, observational data. Now, a lot of has been done in the last years um, for the surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass. We learned a lot, we have a lot of alternative strategies, and um, they say or they point out what is the influencing factor. So we have to have intraoperatively meticulous hemostasis. We have to have special cardiopulmonary bypass protocols appropriate for the body size. We have to have, there's this one, one paper out uh, from the Jonas Group from Boston at that time that we have during, during on pump, we have to have, have to keep the HKT above 20. This is um, to have significantly less red blood cell transfusion after cardiac surgery. And then the third part is the morphology. So be aware of cyanosic intracardiac shunts, QPQS, so about the 
pre-operative optimization of the pre and after load, and as well, for sure, we know of all the abnormalities and uh, as well of the associated congenital ab abnormalities in our patients, our special patient cohort with congenital heart diseases. And now this is, I think this is the, the biggest point where we really should work on, and this is the checklist. So how can we really have an institutional management strategies? And I really, I worked hard to find some guidelines, some SOPs, there's nothing published. And everybody has its own institutional strategy, how to avoid blood or how to, um, how to treat these patients and how to cope with red blood cell transfusion. And what do they say in these, or what do they point out? They say, really try to have standardized protocols and it's for sure. This is a multidisciplinary input and on the pediatric intensive care units, we need protocols for limiting the blood draws as well as defined decision free for transfusion. And so the goal of everybody working with the children and, and thinking about should I transfuse, yes or not, where's the indication, we should always try to, to get improvement efforts for critical care quality. Now, some more data about post-CPB, limited and minimized blood sampling. This sounds very easy, but really keep it in mind and do it. There's observed a study on it before, and they could show for sure that um, they had reduced blood loss, and this is especially in the neonates, neonates and have small tubes, and we are, we're waiting for the blood drop where we can measure all, all the important values. And um, then the cell saving of the blood, Intraoperatively, there's a lot of data, and I think almost every center does it. And for post-operative cell saver management, there's one single randomized trial which showed reduced transfusions. And now <laughs> I showed you the data from the adult population. Now we come to the pediatric cardiac um, surgery population. There are three randomized controlled trials published, and one subgroup analyzes, and they say there's a tolerance of restrictive transfusion thresholds. But you can't compare them because they are varied HP thresholds, they are varied outcome measurements, and some key exclusions which are in all these randomized control, control trials are the neonates, the bleeding, and the hemodynamically unstable patients. So I could finish with my talk now, but now you didn't get really what, what should I do or what is the message, the take home message. Then we thought, okay, we, let's pick out one special group of patients which is really ill. So these are the patients with a hypoplastic left heart syndrome. We have to challenge high mortality interstate. And so we performed a little online survey. I think some of you, thank you very much, uh, answered the questions. So we send out 15 questions online to 50 different centers and we got 15 responses. And I would like to show you some of the responses. So we started a lot of very special shoes. We started off with which department are you affiliated in because this red blood cell transfusion is an issue for all of us in which, which area, whatever department we are working in. So you can see there, 60% were pediatric cardiologists and there were some surgeons who answered it as well as pediatric the intensivists and some of the anesthesiologists who also faced with red blood cell transfusion during the operation. Um, we wanted to have all the centers as well, and we want to see how many uh, um, novel procedures do you perform annually. You can see down here. And we also tried to get the huge centers from the US, but unfortunately they didn't answer, so we have about half-half. We have 40% uh, who perform less than 10 procedures per year, and 60% of the responders, they perform in between 10 to 25. And now comes the data, which really uh, sticks very much to what is published. Um, uh, you, can, you, can just have, you can just look at it and you can see it's always divided half-half. So do you have, for this special pa patient population, do you have an interstage um, um, program, do you give erythropoietin or do the children get uh, iron? You can see it's divided, uh, half says yes, half says no, as well for the monitoring, it's half, half. Then we looked for what do you, what is there an inferior threshold hemoglobin or hematocrit level for blood transfusion during the post-operative ICU stay, so directly after the novel procedure, and as well we had 50-50, and then we asked for the threshold, uh, and we got many numbers, so one center said 
We would transfuse uh, on the ICU after the operation of the HBS under 10 comp per deciliters. Another said 12, another said 14. And as some of you in the audience are aware, there's also a center where we shoot really for 16 to 80 gram per deciliters. Um, yeah, so this is, this is act really actual data. This is uh, where, we are, where we are faced with uh, at the moment. And this, this September issue from Pediatric Critical Care Medicine is completely on red blood cell transfusion, on, on transfusion and what to do. So the whole community um, uh, is faced with this question. It's, it's such an exciting question and we need to get some answers. We need to sit together and this is what they did, the taxi. They call themselves taxi. So this is the Pediatric Critical Care Transfusion and Anemia Expertise Initiative. They, they came together and tried to pool the data, did meta-analysis and put up this decision-making tree. And I would like to highlight down here, you can see these are our patients with cardiac diseases. Uh, and if we look for the single ventricle physiology, stage one palliation, they, if, it's, if the patient is stable and everything is stable and perfect, um, they say the transfusion threshold would be nine gram per deciliter. As well, single stage, single ventricle physiology, stage two and three, again, it's only nine gram per deciliter. This is what they pointed out in this, in this study, and I really can highly recommend it. The whole volume is all about red cell transfusion in critically ill patients. Now we heard about that we don't really have, um, uh, we have many opinions, and we don't really have a conclusion for this, but this is why I think we have to look at alternative strategies. Alternative, what are the, which can be the alternative strategies for, um, for transfusion, and one of the, one very interesting part is um, the, the umbilical uh, cord blood. To use this, there's a group from Kiev, Ukraine, and they published, they published in 2011 in the European Journal of Cardiothoracic Surgery. They performed open cardiac surgery in the first hours of life, and they used this autologous umbilical cord blood. They did, in the first series, it was kind of a pilot study which they published, 14 consecutively prenatally diagnosed patients with congenital heart diseases. They started with it. So if you re go deeper into the publication, you can see that six received red blood cell transfusion intraoperatively due to bleeding. They operated in between the first 24 hours. It's, they, they, don't, they didn't show any outcome data, no inflammatory response, no tissue edema, capillary leakage, all these problems we face with when we operate on neonates, there was no data available. They did another, it's the same group from, the, from Ukraine, um, they published again in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2012. Um, I think all in all it were 16 patients with, at, with prenatally diagnosed um, uh, transposition of the great arteries and they performed the arterial switch operation within the first hours of life and they again used this autologous umbilical cord blood and uh, there were 21 patients in this publication and if you read all the comments from the pediatric cardiac surgeons later on, it's really interesting. There are many questions uh, coming up. It's still preliminary alternative strategy. Um, so we think it's an innovative technique and we have, there are preliminary results out and um, so we looked how much, I asked our transfusion, um, uh, transfusion uh, unit department and they said you can have up to, in between 70 to 90 ml of core blood you can harvest, you can also store it nowadays. That was the problem of these um, people from Ukraine, they couldn't store it, that's why I think they also operated very quickly. Um, there's more data from kind of underdeveloped countries where they don't really have so much blood. They really suffer from a loss or from, uh, yeah, from a shortage of, of, of um, red blood cell units. Uh, so there's data from South Korea and as well 10 neonates from India are operated with using the harvested core blood. Another, really this is now future music. Future music is, um, so we have the autologous core blood transfusion and there's, there, this is still bench side, this is still basic research. Artificially, we can, they, they can produce artificial blood already. This, so the substitutes, the substitutes can either be 
chemically based or can be hemoglobin based. And um, another, which I found very interesting publication, um, is on uh, universal blood. So as you know, um, there's the technology of CRISPR-Cas9, so they did gene editing and put away the, the antigen, so they generated antigen null, and it's really called null because it's different from, uh, from blood group zero. But still, this is all, uh, all uh, still basic research. It's not, it's not there. There are animal trials. They started animal trials, but there, there's no, there are no clinical uh, studies there up to now. So let's, let's sum it up. From the past, oh, I skipped the past because we heard so much about history, history and the time is short. Past, there was really a hype, and but now we know it's kind of a blood transfusion is kind of a liquid transplant, and today we really look for restrictive transfusion strategies. There is evidence in multi-center randomized trials, and they all conclude that the restrictive is not inferior to liberal strategies. Pediatric trials are missing. The blood conserving strategies are there. Uh, we know we have the minimized HLM, we have the art artificial blood, future music, and we have autologous core blood. But be aware that the risk can be mit mitigated but not el eliminated. So to transfuse is always unavoidably unsafe. And it's the only tissue you cautiously transplanted with a stroke of a mouse click. So the safest transfusion is the one you don't give. Thank you very much.